Uh, so yes, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk about how to recognize IO bottlenecks and what you can do about them. Um, just to give you a, a bit of background, um, I am the um, founder of Alexis. Alexis is the IO profiling company. And so today I'm going to be sharing um, some of the challenges that our customers have faced um, and, and, and what they do about them. So um, our customers come from a range of HPC backgrounds. Um, uh, most of our customers are in life sciences, semiconductor, um, oil and gas finance, or general HPC. Um, I'm sure you'll recognize some of the names at the bottom. And what we provide is IO profiling tools to help them understand their applications, understand the way they're accessing storage, understand their dependencies for migration, and in general, give them the tools that they need to make better decisions about, about the sto their storage needs and how they can best serve their user base. And what uh, almost all of our customers have in common is they have got mixed workloads on shared systems. Um, those mixed workloads are very different. Um, so for example, in the semiconductor space and in the life sciences space, Typically, jobs are single machine, often single core. Um, so we've got um, semiconductor customers who run millions of jobs per day. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, they there are customers who have large MP, uh, MPI applications um, who write, might run um, fewer than a million jobs per year, but their jobs are um, spanning multiple machines and so much kind of wide applications. And what all of them have in common is um, lots of scientific applications, lots of varied applications, not necessarily very good control of the, over those applications or control over what users do. And so IO profiling is as much about informing policy as it is about tuning or optimization. But that's that's something. I'll look at in a bit more detail kind of as we go through different case studies. Um, this slide, if you've seen me speak before, you'll have seen this slide before. It's a really neat example of um, how IO, IO problems can arise even when the application itself is um, very well designed. And it's also an example of how you can fix IO problems even if you can't edit the application. Um, this is an example of an application run at ARM, and it's a, um, it's a hardware compilation job. It's supposed to store all of its temporary data on slash temp, um, which is fast local storage. But this application has been set up to run, um, to store all of its temporary files on scratch space, which is, which is a shared um, Isilon system. And whenever this application is run at scale, the performance of that Isilon is affected adversely. And so um, this application is not only running more slowly than it needs to itself, but it's also slowing down everybody else who's trying to use that shared file system. So um, a really good example of a sort of noisy neighbor application um, of the sort that, that Catherine described earlier. Um, the solution is, is uh, really, um, uh, pleasingly simple and um, simply can reconfigure the, the application to store temporary files in slash temp instead, which was in this case just a, a question of changing a single environment variable um, with the path. And the tools that we provide to give people insights um, uh, will be uh, the data from those tools will be the focus of the of the talk today. Um, obviously, there are other IO profiling tools out there, um, some with overlapping, some with um, different functionality from um, what I'm presenting today. Um, but these are the these are the tools that we provide. Um, Breeze is our product for doing detailed profiling um, and detailed um, dependency analysis. So, uh, for example, if you're trying to move an application or you're trying to 
um, containerizing application, you will need to know the dependencies, which mount points, which files, um, which network locations, where is this application getting its license from? Does it have any other network dependencies? Um, all of these questions you need to know. Um, and on top of that, you also need to know the IO profiling information. So what are the resources it's using over time? What is the peak performance? What is the kind of mean performance? Um, as we've discussed, um, IO performance is enormously variable over the um, lifetime of the application usually, uh, and different applications have got wildly different IO profiles and wildly different IO needs. Um, interestingly, a lot of our customers with high performance file systems, their applications don't necessarily require a lot of data themselves, but it's uh, only when they run at scale do they have these high performance computing needs. So um, the IO won't necessarily have been designed with high performance shared file systems in mind, particularly for legacy applications, um, but they certainly have got um, wide ranging impact on that shared file system when when they run across sort of a thousand nodes, for example. And when you're running across a thousand nodes, um, uh, Mistral is a much better IO profiling tool to use. Um, it is the scalable answer to Prees and it's designed to run in production to give you that constant feed. It doesn't collect as much information as you get with Brees, um, because you wouldn't want to do that at scale. Um, instead, Mistral gives you a constant feed for, for IO, that bandwidth metadata, um, CPU, memory, um, the, and the performance that the application is experiencing from the file system. Um, sorry, you've probably just heard my air conditioning turn on. That will stop in a minute. So looking at the kind of problems that uh, that we commonly see in uh, in applications, um, the first thing we usually tell people to look at is how much time you're wasting doing bad I.O. Um, and at the top of that list, um, not necessarily on this application, but on most applications is small reads and writes, obviously very damaging to the file system. Uh, uh, opening files that aren't used. Um, statting files that aren't used, you'd be amazed how much time is spent by applications opening and statting um, files that are never read or written. Um, a common cause of that is things like um, if you've got a lot of locations in the path variable, it's not uncommon um, for users to automate the um, loading of their working environment um, for tools that they, they use every day. Now that a uh, set of tools will change over time and they quite often leave old configurations um, in their in their environment and can end up with hundreds and hundreds of locations on in their path variable. Um, that means every time they access a, a, an application, for example, if they run LS, it may well try and access the LS binary from every single location on that path. <clears throat> leading to lots of opens uh, and stats or failed execs um, uh, for um, uh, across the, the shared file system. So opens and stats on uh, unused files are a real um, red flag. Um, even if the time spent doing that is relatively low, the load on the file system is significant. And if you run the application at scale, obviously that can cause problems. So I'm going to go through a couple of case studies. Um, this first one is from the Sanger Institute. Um, they had a genome pipeline um, that was relatively mature, and it was being used as part of the Can Pan, Can Pan Cancer Project, um, which was a project to map 2,000 whole human genomes um, across the UK. Um, they needed to containerize the pipeline for portability. The Sanger Institute is uh, very well equipped um, uh, from, a, from a computing standpoint, but not all the other HPC centers um, are as well equipped. Um, they needed to optimize the IO so that it can be run across, across different compute platforms. Um, and the, the initial part of the project, um, they did IO tuning um, on-prem um, uh, using our tools. 
and then the second phase of the project which is the um the part that i'm going to focus on today uh is when they had already optimized the io and they'd already containerized the application for portability and they were looking at specifying how to run this this application um, we looked at site at um how to run it on aws not necessarily because it was being run in AWS, some centers were, some centers weren't, but that gives you a good sort of benchmark for comparison in terms of specifying what the compute and the storage needs are. So the first phase of the um, optimization that they did in-house, and they're very lucky in that they, they have active development on this application and so were, were able to modify the application when they found bottlenecks. Um, they, initially reduced the runtime from 32 hours down to 18 hours and through a mixture of profiling with our tools and just um, internal knowledge about the application. Um, very specifically looking at where they expected the CPU utilization to be high but it wasn't as high as, as, uh, as they were hoping. The second part of the project was looking at what this application needs. So here is a, a, a profile that we took on AWS showing what the kind of new requirements of the application were. So you can see that um, it does quite a large number of IO operations, um, just over 5 million in total. Most of them were small reads, um, that's to say less than 32K. Um, down at the bottom here, we can see that the vast majority were, um, or oh, there were a large number of um, 4 to 8K reads, um, that's really common with life sciences applications, but where they put a massive amount of work in was in grouping reads that are co-located into slightly larger reads. So this um, uh, large number of uh, 8K and 16K reads is really a testament to the amount of effort they put in to optimize that IO and try and not necessarily achieve large streaming reads, but, but make it at least larger than 4K. So the next thing we did was run storage comparison across um, different storage options available, a mixture of um, uh, default SSD, um, uh, NVMe and magnetic storage. Um, as you can see from this, uh, from this chart, um, the provisioned IOPS SSDs performed very badly. Um, they guarantee a certain number of IOPS, but because the, as you'll see from the next chart, because the IO was very lumpy um, uh, for the genomic pipelines, um, the provisioned IOPS were under-provisioned during the, the high IO phases and then wasted for the rest of the time. So really not worth the money. Um, they assumed much more even um, usage of IO. Um, and really surprisingly, the um, the AWS default option, just the standard SSD was the best option. Although NVMe was faster, it was only slightly faster for a 10% price increase. So looking at what that, why that is, um, here we've got a breakdown of some of those different storage options. Um, the, here's the NVMe slightly faster than the default um, SSD. And we're getting about the same um, performance during the the read phase of the of the application, the provisioned IOPS here is just really throttled um, to the maximum IOPS for that um, solution, and the magnetic disk just can't keep up either. So the next thing we did was look at the CPU utilization compared with the IO. Um, uh, so. Here we've got the read bandwidth compared with the total number of IO operations um, and the CPU. Um, at the beginning is the intensive read phase, and you can see that the CPU utilization um, is only using one or two cores out of four, but those cores are actually maxed out, which is something we didn't expect to see. So this is a really interesting example of where high CPU utilization may actually uh, imply that the application is IO bound um, in some respects. So confusing CPU bound and IO bound operations is something that we see quite a lot because often with small IO, you see high CPU utilization at the same time as high IO operations. So the next thing we did was upgrade the CPU, 
CPU and downgrade the memory. Um, this interestingly ran the application significantly faster and therefore reduced the overall cost despite the fact that this was a more expensive CPU. So making sure that if you've if you've got the heterogeneous environment, making sure that you run your applications across the right file system and on the right machines is obviously very important um, to make sure that you're getting the, the best value out of your infrastructure. Um, and just looking at, at why that was, actually with the larger CPU, um, even on the default storage, um, we still got um, significantly high IOPS um, during that read phase at the beginning. Um, which implies that actually we were CPU bound, not IO bound, um, despite the fact that we were only using two CPUs. So this saved around 10 to 40 percent of the cloud cost of the project, depending on the the, um, the memory required. That's something that we didn't look at in a lot of detail, and it just shows that actually with a small amount of effort, you can have some some really big wins. So um, we'll look at some more examples of that as well. Um, I'm now going to switch to the semiconductor industry. Um, so this is an example from Qualcomm, where Qualcomm has put a lot of time and effort into um, gathering application dependencies, making sure that applications are not accessing data that they shouldn't. Um, for example, uh, it's very easy for projects that have grown up organically from um, from older workflows to still have um, symlinks or, um, or, or uh, dependencies in those older workflows. And that makes it a, an absolute nightmare to manage the applications. It makes it a nightmare to, to adopt any kind of new technology such as cloud or containerization. Um, and it makes it very hard to, um, to modernize those applications in general. So. Um, what they do is they profile the applications in Breeze um, and look very carefully at the application dependency. So not just the um, uh, not just the mount point. They also look at individual files and and where that um, where that file came from. Is it an external dependency? Is it uh, an internal dependency? Um, and that helps them inform decisions about where to move the data. And I would say that. 90% of projects should start by profiling the dependencies before you start looking at IO patterns, because that can bring up all kinds of older dependencies, such as libraries that you shouldn't be using, um, uh, scripts that you didn't know you, you had, um, Python files. Uh, a lot of applications use Python in their infrastructure, and Python can be uh, an absolute nightmare it loads so many libraries just to do a hello world so if you're running a short application with python stop and write it in something else um, that so removing all those dependencies um, can really make a difference massive difference to the to the performance of the io um, even before you've looked at any other aspect of kind of profiling over time and so on um, this is another semiconductor workflow so um, uh, this is an application that spent over um, uh, over 36 seconds doing small reads um, in a in a runtime of of one minute 40 seconds. So really a significant amount of time. Um, and if you look at sort of the breakdown of that I/O, it's really all open. So what this application is doing, as you see the the, the, the amount of time or the number of operations for reads and metadata is roughly equal. Um, even though the CPU load is high, all it's doing is opening files and then reading from them once. Um, obviously, there are some reasons why it's doing that um, that are kind of integral to the applications. But building that into the architecture of your workflow, um, you could easily do a lot to optimize that. So, for example, if it's possible to store the these many small files that this workflow needs as a single archive um, on shared storage and then cache them somewhere local and fast during the, the run of the application, um, then that's going to be hugely beneficial, particularly as this application uses a paid license. Um, so 
the amount of time it takes to download um, and untar um, the archive of files that this application needs um, is going to be hugely beneficial because you can do all of that before you load up the third party tool, before you check out that license. So you're going to get a lot more value for money in terms of that for that license if you do a lot of the I.O. work ahead of time. So just moving on to the last example, I realize I'm running running out of time. Um, uh, this is an MPI application um, that um, the Hartree Center um, were optimizing. It's an internally developed application. So again, they're very lucky in that they can um, modify the application. It's under current developments, and so they can just go to the to the users and tell them uh, tell them what to change. Um, it is a the application DL Poly is a general purpose um, molecular dynamics tool, and um, what we discovered very very quickly on profiling is that although it had been architected so only one MPI rank on each machine was supposed to do I/O. In fact, every single rank opened and closed the files that were being used, in in, in particular this um, history file. So this is showing one MPI rank, which is supposed to do no I/O, and you can see continuously it's opening and closing this this history file. Um, so I think it. Um, uh, spent a total latency of 17 minutes during the run of the application, um, which was only um, 14 minutes in total. So really significant amount of time spent doing I.O. Um, completely unnecessarily. So this uh, this was obviously very easy to fix, um, just a, a couple of line changes um, in the application, and it gave significant performance improvements. I think they only tested it across 16 nodes. They normally run across this application across hundreds of nodes, but even over 16 nodes, they saw an 8% performance improvement. So really, really worth doing. Um, and that's something that we see again and again in that people have thought about the I/O for. Uh, for the reads and writes, but just neglected to think about the impact of metadata operations. So uh, to kind of round up those uh, thoughts a little bit, um, one thing we always recommend is profile in production. It's very easy for an application in a controlled environment to have good I.O. and then you put it in production and suddenly you realize that some script has changed the environment and you've put all of your data in the wrong place. Um, optimization. It's about looking, uh, looking in the right place and very quickly discarding the areas which won't give you any, any improvement. Um, uh, something all of our customers have in common is that they may, they may be, have storage bottlenecks, they may have budget bottlenecks, but they definitely have people bottlenecks. Um, we've never come across uh, an HPC organization that has people sitting around doing nothing. And so looking at where you spend your time and ensuring very, very quickly that that time spent is going to give you um, big benefits, um, that is the, the most important thing you should think about when, when profiling. Um, and finally, for third party applications, most of our customers either are running third party applications or they're running applications developed in house that they don't have the resources to change. And so that's all about steering. It's about locating the data in the right place. It's about using scheduling um, decisions to, to um, stagger workloads. Um, it's about putting data on the right file system for the IO patterns. Um, Burst buffers can be very effective, as, as we have just seen, um, but only when run against workloads um, that suit the, the optimization that the burst buffer has been designed for. So, um, so steering can be as effective as, uh, as optimization and, uh, and doesn't require you to go and, and speak to the developers. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Rosemary. So it's always uh, very pleasant to see a uh, use case where IO profiling is actually really uh, bringing a, a nice uh, performance improvement. I have a, a couple of questions for you. So one of them is related to the specificities of the AI workload. Have you 
observe uh, already some kind of segmentation in terms of problem and issue, depending on either HPC or AI? Um, yes, I have. That's a very interesting question. Um, what we tend to see is that AI workloads are newer, and so they don't have the same kind of legacy dependencies that um, that you get with with older workloads. Um, so, um, uh, for example, they're not still using old IO libraries that have got very bad IO patterns. Um, newer workloads tend to be much faster, much more effective and have got less kind of legacy rubbish um, in there. So, um, so for example, very long paths which, uh, where applications trawl hundreds of, of areas on a shared file system. We don't tend to see that with AI workloads. The environment tends to be much cleaner um and uh ai workloads tend to be um very boring from an uh, from an io standpoint i uh, i e the, the amount of data looked at is is so small it's it's um not really worth um doing a lot of optimization or tend to be very very large um and run at, at absolutely enormous scales um we did some work um with aws and one of their um machine learning, um, uh, self-driving car um, customers, where for each run, they wanted to scale up to 200,000 machines. Um, so really, really astonishing scales for, for a single workload. Um, but because they, ten they tend to be very boring, you can do really, really um, targeted um, IO optimization. So in that case, um, we found that changing some of the um, uh, Linux machine settings um, was hugely beneficial to that workload. It was pulling data off um, uh, object store, um, profile, um, processing it locally, and then sending it back. And we found that we could reduce the um, download time from 12 minutes down to four by changing some of the um, some of the write through settings on the on the Linux machine. So, um, so that's that's really interesting. Obviously. For, for highly parallel HPC workloads and workloads that are um, where you get the same workload running on the entire machine. So for example, weather forecasts, um, they also deserve that level of kind of fine tuning. So um, so yeah, for AI, it really depends on the scale. Um, so, um, so I mean, speaking to the, some of the deep mind people, um, the amount of data they, they look at for some of their workloads is just it's, it's just not interesting. It's just not HPC. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, sure. So, so, so thanks for the details. And my last question is related to the ability of the Grease tool. So is it something that I have to to run, uh, let's say that manually, specifically for uh, one job, gather the, the log on to get the result, or is it a tool that can be integrated into my job scheduling environment so I can get a, a report every time a job is... is... Um, so uh, your your audio is fading in and out, but I think I got the, uh, the gist of the question. Ask... Um, uh, actually, um, Breeze can be used in both ways. Um, so... Um, uh, you can either just run Breeze explicitly on your workflow, and it's a um, it works with an LD preload library, so all, all in user space. You don't need to modify your application in any way. You just um, you just you just run it with the um, with the Breeze environment set up, um, and um, uh, you typically just save the the data to disk and then look at it afterwards with with our analysis tools. Um, some of our customers have integrated with their scheduler and use the command line APIs so that you submit your job to the special breeze um, uh, queue and that automatically gives you a report with IO um, patterns and dependencies um, that are extracted with the with the command line API. It is an offline analysis tool though, so you do have to wait until the end to get the results. And the amount of data generated with Breeze is enormous. Um, so, uh, I mean, the log sizes are similar to if you were S tracing because we're gathering kind of similar levels of detail. Um, so, if you want to have a continuous feed of the um, of what's going on on your cluster for 
um, kind of uh, diagnostic and triage purposes, um, then Mistral is the right tool for that. So Mistral instead pushes the data every second or every minute, every hour, depending on how you set it up, to a live database. And so you get a, uh, a live dashboard um, showing you what's going on, still at the job level, um, but um, uh, but across the across the entire cluster or how, whatever section you've decided to to profile. So um, so usually um, uh, Mistral is the tool that you would use when you know, you you want overall I/O patterns. You want to kind of treat the job uh, like a black box. You don't necessarily care about individual file I/O and and things like that. Okay, so thanks a lot, Rosemary. So let's thank the speaker, and we, we close this first session of the afternoon.